So I just wanted to um, briefly welcome Eddie back to Tupton Norbu Ling. We're grateful that he's accepted another invitation to teach for us. He's a wonderful teacher at uh, Longri Tongpa Center in Australia. You can find him there virtually or in person at some point, I guess. Um, so thank you again for, uh, for another offering another wonderful course for us. Thank you so much. Okay. So should I begin or Shaila, do you have anything to say? I should begin? Okay, thank you. <laughs> so hi, everybody. And welcome back along to a course for the Understanding Karma to Create the Future We Want. Right, so I'll just say a few words and then we'll, um, we'll do a, a, a meditation and then we'll start, we'll start the course and I'll explain what's going to happen during the course. So um, we are all human beings and it's not easy to take breath as a human being. It requires a lot of uh, causes and conditions to find ourselves in this, um, in this situation. So it's a terrific situation. It's fantastic because we have a possibility to remove suffering and its causes and uh, create or bring into fruition all of the good qualities that we have um, as potential at the moment. Um, so as human beings, we have choices to make. And those choices can either create more causes and conditions for our own suffering, or they can create causes for happiness. So these choices are, are ours. And um, I think I, I know, you know from experience and, and um, let's say just in general, I think uh, every sentient being would prefer happiness than suffering. Uh, so if you had a choice, if you could actually consciously make the choice and say, Eddie, I'd like to go towards happiness, greater and greater happiness and diminish the suffering I experience in this life. And you know, knowing your future lives, um, having less suffering there as we um, take rebirth within cyclic existence. So understanding karma cause and effect can actually help us get out of cyclic existence or um, provide better conditions while we're within it so that we can continue with our spiritual path. So um, I'd just like to read a little quote from Lama Zopar Bishay. So he says, um, to achieve fully the most supreme peace, which is freedom from all suffering and the removal of every single obscuration, it's necessary to actualize completely the whole path, which is the Dharma jewel. This starts by correcting each tiny action, avoiding all negative harmful actions and practicing all positive actions. And this is called observing karma. Therefore, understanding karma is the root of all perfections and happiness and the very foundation of the path to enlightenment. So um, if, if his words um, haven't convinced you that this is the case, I don't know whether mine will, but I want to contribute towards um, what he said and many of the masters of the past have said, and which you can discover just living this life. You know, if, if you know what causes suffering, you can stop doing it. If you know what leads to the greater happiness, you can engage in, in doing that. So this course is sort of like about that, trying to understand karma cause and effect, creating a future we want. So let's begin uh, by first of all, uh, setting a good motivation for doing so. So please uh, get yourself comfortable in the seat. Allow your shoulders to sort of fall down naturally and your back to straighten up a little. You can chuck, uh, tuck your chin in just slightly and you can keep your eyes closed or keep them open. And you can place your hands wherever you like, wherever feels most comfortable for you. And I'd like you to just become aware of the feeling of breathing. Now 
to feel the breath as the body naturally breathes itself. And movements that take place within the body as you inhale and exhale. So the purpose for bringing awareness to the breath is just to slow everything down, have the body relax and the mind to be focused. And it's from this neutral state of being that we can set the mind in a positive direction. So while you're breathing normally and naturally and are at ease, imagine all the Buddhas and the Bodhisattvas have appeared in front of you and that you're surrounded by all sentient beings. You're going to take refuge on behalf of all sentient beings. You wish to deliver each and every one of them into the state of enlightenment. So we're going to take refuge in the Buddhas, the Bodhisattvas um, and their teachings. So if you'd like to just recite along with me. I go for refuge until I am enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the merits I create through listening to the Dharma, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I am enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the merits I create through listening to the Dharma, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I am enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the merits I create through listening to the Dharma, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. Now, um, strengthen this wish, enhance it uh, by recollecting the four immeasurable thoughts of love and compassion, joy and equanimity. Make a wish that all beings can abide in that state those four states. And then make a determination that you will help them to do so. You'll create these four immeasurable ways of being within your own mental continuum and you will help others do the same. Now think that from the heart of the Buddha, um, rays of light and nectar emanate and come through space and wash over you and over the vast crowd of beings surrounding you. So remove every kind of hindrance to these four immeasurable thoughts and establish you in that way of being. These four boundless ways of being. So feeling clean and clear and empowered, we're now going to uh, recite the seven limb prayer. And we can imagine ourselves actually making the prostrations, making offerings, confessing and so forth. So again, this right recite along with me. Reverently, I prostrate with my body, speech and mind. I present clouds of every type of offering, actual and imagined. I declare all my negative actions accumulated since beginning this time and rejoice in the meritable, holy and ordinary beings. Please remain until the end of cyclic existence and turn the wheel of Dharma for living beings. I dedicate my own and others' merits to the great enlightenment. And now to finally rid ourselves of the last vestiges of clinging to any merit we might have accumulated, to the ideas we have and so forth, we can offer a mandala to the uh, 
refuge field. I think that when, when doing this, your, your body has completely um, banished from the wisdom of insight and reappeared as a wonderful pure land that you're going to offer to the uh, Buddha and the merit field. I think it's this ground, anointed with perfume, stirring with flowers, the dawn of Mount Meru, four continents, the sun and the moon. I imagine this is a Buddha field and offered. May all of them beings enjoy this pure land. Idam Durata Mandala Kamayataya Ami. So we've released the offering and it's been accepted by the Buddha in the refuge field. And the Buddha smiles at us and we look up into his eyes. We see him smiling and we feel accepted and at ease. Now an emanation of the Buddha and it leaves his heart moves through space and comes to bite above the crown of your head, facing in the same direction you are. The emanation descends, entering your skull, coming down through the body to rest at the level of your heart. Its radiance begins to increase and expand, filling your body and mind. And the light goes out through the pores of your skin, filling the 10 directions of space. And wherever sentient beings abide within space, see that they are touched by the light and fully transformed into states of full awakening. And allow a sense of joy to pervade the mind. Feeling that you have brought to full enlightenment every sentient being. Now the lights begin to withdraw from the ten directions of space and they re-enter your heart. Feel yourself in body, breathing normally and naturally and sitting in your seat. You acknowledge that this meditation has taken place purely on the level of imagination. Nevertheless, you've implanted a seed or a potential to bring this into actuality. And you reaffirm, you know, I, I will do this. I will do my very best to awaken the potential I have to be a fully awakened being and help others to do the same. Now breathing in deeply through your nostrils. Exhale through the mouth. Now your eyes to flutter open and to bring yourself back into the awareness of your room and the fact that you're sitting down and you're in front of a screen uh, engaging in the class. So again, uh, welcome everybody to this course. And I just want to say a few words about um, basically cause and effect, first of all. So you know, all of us, we can uh, acknowledge that effects have specific causes. That the external things that we see around us, for instance, we have uh, screens in front of us, we are sitting on seats. These are like effects. So these are results. And these effects or results depend upon other things to bring them into uh, 
reality. They, you know, they need to be produced in some way. So the production of these external events depends upon uh, causes and conditions. And um, if we look around us at the physical world, and we can try and you know, see, like, like I said, the screen in front of us, the seats we're on, they have causes and conditions, they depend upon them. And so does everything else that our senses can apprehend. Now, if we start going like back and look at each cause and say, okay, so that's a cause, what did that cause depend upon? We're going to find another cause and it's going to have to be supported by other conditions. And what we're going to do is we're going to find going back, 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 back until we're going to end up with, what we say, you know, the beginning of this universe. And um, the we go, it's going to be very difficult for any of us to say, you know, what, what the specific causes are for it. But we can talk about it like in general. So in general, it said the cause of the universe is what's phrased as the Big Bang. So all the material phenomena have come out of this, out of this Big Bang. And it is produced, it's subject to uh, decay and disintegration, meaning everything that's produced is changing. Uh, the physical world around us is changing, and we have physical bodies, and so they are also subject to change. And all these changes are dependent upon causes and conditions. Now, if we um, now move our attention to uh, ourselves and look at our internal events of um, happiness and suffering. So we're not always happy and we're not always suffering. And we know that when we're happy, it's subject to change. And it's the same thing when we're unhappy, when we're suffering, it's subject to change. That means it's under the control of causes and conditions. Um, from a Buddhist perspective, we really talk about we talk about like karmic causes and conditions that can bring about these subtle changes. Uh, in the world in general, when we're talking to um, people who have no comprehension of the teachings of the Buddha, karma won't even come into it. Uh, what they'll probably refer to is um, genetic causes, genetic genetic conditions, or um, physical causes and conditions. But there's no real comprehension there of the Buddhist teachings of karma uh, causes and the effects of those causes. When we bring in the Buddhist teachings of karma cause and effect, what we're really doing is bringing into awareness the ethical dimension of our, act, of our actions. So um, today I want to have a look at um, some of these causes and, and really sort of um, talk about a couple in particular called um, substantial causes and, and the conditions that support them. So I'll open up the, the class now and come to the slide and then we'll, we'll go through. So that as I present this course, basically it's, it'll have a slide and it'll have some information on it with a picture and, and I'll talk a little bit about it. And as we go along, please, if any of you have any questions as we go, uh, let Riffy know and um, we can talk about it there. We'll just, we'll just slow down, stop, and we'll just talk about it then and then. Okay. So I'll start with a share screen. So here we go, we've got five classes over five weeks, and our topics are going to include the general characteristics of karma, what, what, what it is in terms of our actions of body, speech, and mind, virtuous and non-virtuous karma, how it can produce um, effects in the future, and what those effects might be, projecting and completing karma, 
And finally, like how to purify that karma. And I've relied upon primarily on, on these books, but also upon the teachings I've had from um, my own teacher, uh, King Sarupashe Gishitashi Seri. Now, these two books up the top, The Foundation of Buddhist Practice by the Dalai Lama and Tukman Chodron, and the next book, Buddhism One Teacher, Many Traditions by the same authors. These are terrific books. They um, go into it with, in, in depth, but the way it's written, the language used is, is comprehensible. We can understand it. Um, for me, the, the, um, they're very, very good books. And I can tell you now that you'll have them on your bookshelf and you will be continually referring to them. I, I use these all the time for every course I do, and primarily because it, it's easy to understand. Now, this book down the bottom here called What is Karma? What it isn't and why it matters by Charlie Kaabda Rinpoche. This is also very good. This gives you the history of the development of karma. And like it says, what it is and what it isn't. It's a fantastic book, like, there's a foundation for going, okay, this is what the Buddha means by karma, and this is what it meant. This is what they talked about in the past. This is how it's changed. Very useful book. Once again, very well written. And finally, this book on the bottom here, Science and Philosophy in the Indian Buddhist Classics. So there's two of the ones called The Physical World, and there's the other one out on the mind, Dynamite. However, um, it's good to have some background for it. Um, the language is, is uh, understandable. It's, it's not um, really densely written. But it really just goes into more and more detail. And it, and it can be a little overwhelming. <laughs> <laughs> but nevertheless, I, I think it's very clear. You know, this, these are the, the major books I'll be using uh, in, this, in the um, presentations over the five weeks. And when I bring in a new book, I'll, I'll put that up there too and, and talk to you a little, bit about, a little bit about it. Now, today's outcomes, what are we going to look at today? Well, I'll base today's teaching on sort of 10 questions that were placed in a course called Discovering Buddhism. So what, one, of the, one of the modules in that course is, is about uh, karma, and they have a section for review where they ask a number of different questions. And today's course is going to cover like 10 of those questions. So they, in that course, of course, they ask like, what is karma? So they're going to identify what it is, um, the different forms of intention, because we put it described karma as an um, intention. And some of the different types of uh, causes, primarily these two, substantial and cooperative causes. I'm going to use a, couple, a number of different analogies of the seed and its fruit. And also answer the questions like, um, if somebody doesn't believe in karma, you know, are they still under its power? Now, what could happen to us, uh, um, which is important to sort of acknowledge and um, be aware of, is how we can superimpose um, theistic conceptions. So most of us come from Christian background, right? and we will have been affected by our education and our religion. So it's important to try to identify if you do uh, superimpose uh, theistic conceptions on the teaching of karma, so by theistic, I mean beliefs in God and the Creator and so forth. Of, of um, I say good and evil, or punishment, sin, these sort of things. But if you do, just be aware of it. And if you're sort of unsure, just, just ask the question. Right? It's just fine. We're, we're all interested in this. We're all beginners. And if I can't answer, we might have to rip it off to our host people the group or say, I'll see you next week for the answer. <laughs> um, so, okay. Eddie, I'm just thinking, like, even in one of the translations of the Bodhisattva's way of life, um, mm. it talks all the way through there of sin. Yes, I know. I know. That's right, they did. Yeah, so we have to sort of understand what, what might be meant by the word sin and what it, what it doesn't mean. Yeah, for sure. That's right. 
<coughs> so let's begin by looking at um, <coughs> karma. Sorry. <coughs> that karma. So let's go to the first slide. What's karma? So first of all, karma is an instance of causality. And there are many different types of causality. There is biological causality, chemical, psychological, and the law of karma is, is, is one of them, is one of the instances of cause and effect. So karma literally means uh, action. And it refers to uh, sentient beings, meaning any being with a, with a mind, with a consciousness, intentional, physical, verbal, and mental actions. But it's intentional action. This is what the Buddha brought to it, which is an you know, amazing thing to happen. So let's have a look. Um, so, and karma is an instance of the general law of causality. And it really enters our picture, it matters to us, when our feelings become involved. So the results of our actions, um, whether they um, you know, have painful feelings, present feelings, uh, neutral feelings and so forth, is that the experience of, of those feelings is dependent upon some form of action, some form of intended action that took place before the feeling arose. Now, I wanted to put this up and say karma is an instance of the general law of causality because causality is not always karma. So for, for instance, um, the process of cause and effect in the natural world is not karma. It's just cause and effect. You know, we have a, a continuum of consciousness, one moment producing the next. That's not karma either. This is cause and effect. So it's action, but it's not karma. The one, one moment disintegrates, it produces a new moment. And also the um, unending process of the continuity of both matter and mind. This also is not karma, it's, it's just cause and effect. And so that's so why I put this second one up here, and I really like it. So it's you know, one of the <clears throat> statements taken from one of the books by the Dalai Lama, and he says, but karma really enters the picture for us when feeling is involved. You know, because we, we respond to our feelings. So feelings are created through cause and effect, and then there's response from us. And a lot of those times, those responses um, aren't as skillful as they could be. So, you know, we can find out like why that is and we can moderate our um, responses. Um, <clears throat> and the next one. So what is it? Principal meaning. Try and take this away from the us. What is karma? Its principal meaning is volitional action. Actions driven by intention, volition. So, um, yeah, you might have heard um, in different songs and the way that people speak uh, in general, that karma, they often refer to karma as being the effect. So if something bad happens, you say, oh, that's just karma, you can't, you know, that's just how you just have to accept that. That's karma. But strictly speaking, karma is really referring to the cause of the actions that produce these effects. So it's not really sort of, um, many times it's not obvious to us. We have to sort of um, infer or look, look beneath the appearance. Um, so, we've, so here we've got meaning, you know, we're really looking here at, we've got karma as cause, karma is often spoken of as in terms of effect, but there's also karma uh, talked about in terms of what they call imprints. 
and, and seeds. And so we're talking about the imprints. This is what links an action to its eventual result at some time in the future. So you know, we, we, we do an action, the action finishes, and it seems like there's nothing going on, like this, there should be nothing. But an effect can take place later on. So what, what between here and there, what's, what's going on there? So that's described as, as I said, so the imprints of karma, karma imprint. And the result that can take place at some time in the future, um, there are sometimes described as the um, fruitional result, a behavioral result, an experiential result, and an environmental result. So many types of results can come out of an action. And it's, it's, they use the term imprint or, or potential is another way of thinking of it, right? that produces this result. And um, this process uh, functions whether a person believes in it or not. So we have to have this, this description of karma. Um, this is not like, let's say, um, It was, just it was just described by an enlightened person called the Buddha. And he, he saw the workings of it and, and described it to us. Yeah, so we call this now the law of karma. We often use this this way. So it's not set up to like judge people. Um, it's just that, let's say, um, We use the um, analogy of um, of growing a garden and using seeds to produce plants. Right? You know, we put the seed in the ground, and then it's covered with soil. It's got the heat. It's got the moisture. We put the water in there. It has the sunshine. It just grows, right? and, and the seed will disappear over time. It will produce a sprout. It's so natural. Machine? Oh, yeah, Eddie, I'm just thinking that, um, like me, who doesn't know much about gardening, you look at what's happening, you go, why did that happen? I don't get it. And the same kind of thing with events in our life, even if intellectually I know uh, it's, it's not about judging, I still have that thought, that's not fair or that's not right or how could that happen? Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. still... Because it's not an intellectual response that I'm giving. It's confused. <laughs> yeah, it's a that is confused. But that confusion also depends upon many conditions, like, for instance, uh, education, our childhood, uh, religious background, all these sort of things. And it's not, like you say, it's not really a, a thought through response, right? it's more of an emotional response. And it's got this thing of, like, you know, like I said, um, it's not fair, this sort of natural response we have to these events. So we need to have a, have a look at that. Uh, because it's like, you know, can, you know when you look, look at a plant going up like that, you say, well, it's not fair that, that the plant should come up from the seed. Even though you might, you know, might be, say, a weed, right? You don't want weeds in your garden. But hello, there's lots of weeds in the garden. You know, you go, it's not fair. No, no, the weed just comes. It's it's not a matter of fairness. Or why, <laughs> fairness or why, did, why do they have a why do they have a better garden than me? <laughs> That's right. Yeah, these strange questions arise, right? <laughs> and, and we can draw a lot of wrong answers from those questions. So what this is, you know, the idea of like trying to understand a little bit about what karma is and how it works. So that if we're going to ask that question, we have the answer. We know we're not looking. We're not looking out in the wrong places and, and coming up with mistaken responses. You know, like for instance, if, if um, somebody yells at us uh, something rude and we feel hurt by it, you know, we don't go. It's your fault. 
But that, that's the, you know, the normal, natural response for most of us. Um, but, you know, depend upon, you know, that, that's an effect. We're sort of looking for the, the cause. We can easily mis make the mistake of thinking the cause is external to us. Now, when we understand or learn about karmic cause and effect, that type of understanding is going to change. And we find that these, the causes for it are basically coming back from our own mind. Our mind is creating our suffering. Our mind can create our happiness. So it's not like coming out from something external to us. This is, this is where these teachings are going to lead us to. And it's wonderful because it means it puts basically the power back in our own hands. It's like we are the creators. But if we don't take control over the process, well, our mind's just going to keep on creating what it does, and we're going to keep on making the mistakes. But hopefully, through you know, getting some general understanding of this and, and keep on looking into it and relating it back to our own experience, we will stop being so unskillful. Yeah, so when others experience suffering, please don't say, um, oh, that's, that's their karma. You know, that, that's not a real skillful understanding of, of, of karma cause and effect. Try and um, help each, help the other, um, if you can't, or at least don't hurt them by saying something as silly as that. You know, just restrain yourself. Now, why is understanding karma uh, important? So let's look at some of the reasons for it being so. So first of all, it, experiences, it explains how experiences of pain and suffering arise as a result of negative actions, thoughts, and behavior. Like I said, like I, what I think is wonderful about this is like it puts the ball back into our court. Right? We've got hold of the ball here. It also explains how desirable experiences of happiness and joy arise as a result of positive emotions, actions, and their thoughts. And uh, here's the thing to get your head around and to hold on to. Our experiences come from causes and conditions which correspond to their result. Now, when we talk about karma and its effects, uh, it primarily concerns causes created in one life, bringing results in future lives. So that, when you look at this, like, you can say, like, imagine that, like, this life is the future life of a past life. So in that case, in the experiences I'm going through now, what, you know, the fact that I am a human being, the fact that my behaviors are this way and I have these types of experiences, that's, some of that's got to come from the past. Lives that I'm not even aware of, behaviors that I'm not aware of. It's produced um, ways of behavior that seem, you know, what we call unconscious today. Then we can look at this and go, okay, so what am I doing today? How am I behaving in this life? Because in these future lives, what I'm doing now is going to have some effect in the future, just as what I did in the past has an effect in the present. And whether I have lived in the, have lives from the past, the present, or the future, I will always want to avoid suffering. I will always want to be happy. But so it's important that we discover um, how these experiences of pain and suffering arise. What are the negative actions that we engage in? What are the thoughts we have to produce suffering? And if we wish to put an end to it, what do I need to do? Um, and if you know, I really appreciate happiness and feelings of, 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 of goodwill and health and well-being, what do I need to do to keep that going? Like I like it now, I'm going to like it in the future. What do I need to do?
So let's get into the nitty gritty of it. <laughs> look at, look at, let's look at what um, calm was in terms of intention and actions. But before we do, Barbara's raised her hand. So Barbara, what, what would you like to ask? Thank you, Eddie. How much karma um, comes to fruition in our current life versus future lives? Because I feel like I'm creating karma that I am either benefiting from or not benefiting from in this life. Does my question make sense? Yep, yeah, no, no, I, I, I can see. So the second part is, yeah, you're right. <laughs> That's quite right. Eddie, Eddie, just stop the screen share for a sec while you give oh, okay. your answer. Sure, I'll uh, stop the share. Um, so Barbara, can you just say, say that again, especially the first part? You said I, what, what well, how, you, how much sorry, how much sorry. karma that we create, how many how much action that we take now and like today. Mm -hmm. How much of that comes to fruition in this life versus future lives? Because okay. I feel that yep. I create sure. when I do non-virtuous things or have non-virtuous thoughts. They they create they create suffering now. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so I guess what we that sort of under uh, comes under uh, I can say a section of the teachings that might be called like the weight of karma. Right? So within the text, it often says like to experience something now, it's got to have um, it's got to be a pretty powerful action that you do. Uh, mm -hmm. So it seems, I guess, um, I remember one of my teachers, um, Pende Horta, who said to me you know, about how you can have some, it's not instant cause and effect, instant karma, but it's karma that ripens very quickly. He says, you know, like, for instance, if you get punched in the face, it's like you hurt immediately and you can want to strike back immediately. Uh, so he just sort of, I think he said that in sort of like jest, but just to sort of um, keep, keep these teachings sort of grounded. Um, in terms of how it's often um, presented, Bob, is uh, most of the stuff is presented like for the future effects that are going to take place in other lives. So they sort of say, look, be very careful what you do now because it's going to affect your future lives. And, you know, so you know, be careful. You will want to be happy then. In terms of this life, you're going to say, of course, I want to be happy now. I don't want to suffer now. And you're asking, so which, um, you're not asking which, which actions, you're asking how many of the actions, is that right? <laughs> so, I, I guess I'm not, not so much to quantity, but how much of what I'm experiencing in this life am I creating in this life versus what has come from past lives? Like again, when I okay. have, yeah, yeah, sure. okay. um, I, I, I don't know when I have, I'll, I'll go with thoughts. And when I have negative thoughts, say towards someone, that yeah. doesn't feel good. That, 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 that causes suffering. So I, I'm thinking that the action, the karma of having negative thoughts regarding someone causes me suffering now. Or is that a result from past I have to say, <laughs> um, I just got um, in our next slide, which it talks a little bit about this. Um, so, yeah, in terms of comparing the effects of past actions, comparing that into um, future events. Uh, in terms of the, the karma. This is why it's very important to uh, intentionally act. Mm. Uh, to bring to awareness why you are doing something. So, you know, we, we begin our, our classes, um, Barbara, you know, every, every time we begin a class, there's always an intention set. But we always set the intention. 
But this is the same sort of thing, right? So you can look at your actions in this life and go, okay, why am I doing this? So, you know, the idea is set the intention to attain enlightenment. Make that the, well, we're going to, this is the next thing we're going to talk about actually in terms of the slides. Uh, many of our actions, um, there, there's always volition there, there's an intention, but for most of us, a lot of the time, it's sort of um, hidden. You know, what you might call unconscious to us, we, we just act. So practice in Buddha Dharma is like the sort of bringing intention to the act. This is our control over the karmic process. Um, so I'm not sure how I've, I've answered this to your um, to your to your query, Barbara. Um, Venerable, is there anything you'd like to add to it? Is there anything that you can <laughs> help us here? <laughs> well, Miffy, what did you? Um, oh, Venerable. Oh, Venerable. No, I think, I mean, what you're saying is also what I've heard is that um, in order, I think Barbara has a really good point um, that maybe there's a difference between like karmic ripening in the traditional sense and kind of like making a mess of things in the conventional sense, you know, like when we get angry, you know, of course, um, then we tend to react in a negative way in the moment. And then that strains a relationship. And, you know, there, there's sort of an immediate cause and effect from that. Um, but then there's also a karmic seed that's planted in the mind from that. And that is what um, that moment of anger, when that ripens, that will ripen um, like actually as a, different experience as a you know that will have an effect in the kind of experience that we have most probably as you're saying in a future lifetime so i i think that barbara's point was really interesting and really insightful that you know that there is sort of a that there's a, a way of thinking about cause and effect that maybe is just a little bit different because we do um i think that when we act out of a positive state that does have an immediate effect, um, it, both internally, you know, we feel better, we feel more peaceful, we feel more at ease, um, we have more spaciousness to react appropriately, um, and also it improves relationships and helps us, you know, so I, I think that there's that kind of immediate level of cause and effect, but then there's this, I think, that maybe that just isn't the level of cause and effect of karma that we're talking about, but. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Eddie, also, uh, Susan, Susan has a question. Susan Fuji, she's okay. had her hand up for a while. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Fujimoto. Anyway, um, I, it just occurred to me that I don't see how that, that question can be answered. I mean, because it requires like a category, a number, a categorical number or categories of causes. Uh, karmic causes, some of which would end up in a future life and some now, how could that be known? Sure. And, yeah, yeah. and so the way I look at it, and this could be wrong or whatever, but is like the focus for me is just on if we don't create good karma now in this life, we don't feel good in this life. So why not try, you know, and possibly that can land in a future life too if we mm -hmm. just try to create good karma. I don't know actually I don't know because I don't know if a personality trait is a result of bad karma from a past life or something else like like a negative personality trait is what I mean. Anyway, does that make sense? Yep, that's, that's yeah. fine. Yeah I was just I think you're quite right. We can we can we can talk it in general terms here. But to be specific, it's very, I mean, I can't, I, I don't have the mental capacity to go specific. But in general, we can talk about, like I say, feeling happy in this life, feelings are involved with karma, um, in, in long term effects, just as they all see, we, we carry out an activity, the seed is placed upon the mind, other effects follow. So we can have you know, a, a, a multiplicity of effect. 
some taking place in this life, others in future lives. And Miffy, you have to say? Yeah, I was just thinking um, we have kind of dive right into the central um, <laughs> difficulty of karma, which is that it's such a big picture and we're so used to just looking at cause and effect in such a small amount of time. So if we take our ordinary world view of like act well and then and then hope it comes back at us in the short term actually that that kind of works fairly well for some of the time but it, it's not something that we can rely on because many times we are um, betrayed or things go catastrophically wrong so the I mean the whole thing with karma is it's over such a huge um, range of time um, and like mm -hmm. you're saying, we can't specifically say what instance caused what, but I think we can be really specific about the general rule of thumb that we can get really clear and and um, see how it works. But it's over such a huge time frame, um, and that's what we're not used to. Okay. So, so Bob, um, let's have a look at this next slide and see if there's something in here that might be useful. <laughs> So here we're going to look at um, karma from two points of view, I guess. So, so, a, so a karma is created, action, an intended action is created in independence on delusion. So this could be a, a, a positive action or a negative action. It's first of all, the karma of intention. So this is this is um, one Barbara that we we once you know this we should apply this. So before acting, decide why we're going to act. What's the point of this act? What am I trying to achieve here? So it's coming before that. So this man here, I'll put it like this guy has decided he's going to chop some wood. He hasn't chopped the wood yet. But he's going to. So he intends to chop wood. And then here, like, you know, he actually chops the wood. So you've got an intention before the act. And then while you're acting and the action is completed, there is another action. Now, this, this first one, the karma of intention. So this is what the Lama Zai Prophet says, this is the most important one for us. Now, to bring into awareness why we're doing what we're doing. So we, we deliberately create positive karma. And then and we, Eddie, we Mm -hmm. Is this um is this something that I mean sometimes it can feel really contrived setting your motivation because your emotions may not feel very warmly towards people but we're trying to set an altruistic motivation so um, is this something that we can work on or do we have to wait till we feel it? No, you don't wait till you feel it. Actually, you need to put into a lot of thinking behind this. Um, but but I should um, what say. Say something else about that. Um, the, the major thing that will really help you is you understand is that unskillful actions, our unskillful actions produce suffering. Our skillful actions produce happiness. Now we, we've got to get that like, locked in. So, um, but you're quite right also, like it does seem like contrived. I, I know we, we go to, um, it's all not West, West, is it West End? West End in Brisbane. So, you know, so often there's a, a blind person there who has got a little jar and he's, you know, he stands there and he's shaking it, but you know he's there so he could make an offering. So I've noticed myself, the major difference is that when you, you're there and you just put the money in without any thinking and you go on, right? And then, you know, I become aware. There's no, motive, there's no conscious motivation there. There's no motivation here that to this act of generosity, I might bring all beings to the perfection of generosity and enlightenment. 
that's definitely not there. So I know I have to stop in front of them. I know he can't see me, which is good, because I've got to run the whole thing through my mind and consciously go through this app. May I bring you to, to enlightenment? May this activity produce within me and others the perfection. Yeah, it takes time, especially for people like, like myself. You know, most of us, I'm sure, we're, being un we're not conscious of what we're doing. This is how we create suffering for ourselves. So, um, and so in the beginning, yeah, it's like, you know, one plus one is equals two. It's slow. But I don't, that's okay, I think, because I'm, we're so fast anyway. We actually should, we need to slow down and become aware of what we're doing. So the before one is, is, the, is, is pretty much straightforward. And like, you know, like I said, whenever we engage in a class or whenever we finish a class, we become very conscious of our intention. We set it. And as we're doing the class, you know, the mind does all sorts of things while we're engaged in the class. At least this is what's driving it, this first one. So then, Eddie, in that example of giving the, um, the offering to the, the, the blind guy on the street, yeah. um, if, you, if you slow down and, and you know, set a, a conscious altruistic motivation, is that that number one, the karma of intention? Yes, it is. And then yeah. just the normal one, like, you know, just like putting the money in to just shut up and don't bug me. Is that like the second one, the intended karma? Well, it doesn't have to be shut up and don't bug me. It's just, you know, the poor, there's a, there's a bloke who's blind on the street and they need money, so yeah, I'll give them money. But that's that different. second one where you're not thinking so much about it. Yeah, that's right. It's more of, yeah. of the action it's, itself, right? But like I said, it's what is it? Karma is intention. Why? What's driving? What's the volition? What's the driving force here for this activity? So, yeah, we need to, you know, if we examine for most of us, I'm sure we would have, you know, maybe we just feel sorry for the blind person. We know they need money and stuff, so you're here to give it. But, so, would is that then karma? The, the one, the karma of intention or the intended karma? Well, if it's, it's, if it's sorry for them, it's going to be the karma of intention. You know, like, I'm sorry for them, so here you go. But that's not enough, is it? Not if you're, a, not if you're engaged in the Buddha Dharma. It's like, yeah, there's, there's a whole lot missing in that um, understanding of why you're going to give them the money. So not every instance of a mental factor of intention. Uh, so it's a, not every instance of the mental factor of intention creates karma, but volition or intention is always necessary for the creation of karma. So you see before comes like it, like it's an act, right? but then we bring to, like then we bring to volition a volitional act, a voli an act that is determined in some way by us so if we just accidentally had a hole in our pocket and money dropped into the tin that's not karma then <laughs> that's right <laughs> it's cause and effect <laughs> right it's just cause and effect but it's not okay uh, barbara's got her hand up too yep barbara <laughs> yeah bob i i just want to clarify my thinking mm -hmm. So intention is putting the money in, giving the money to the person. But then it, but then the motivation is why I put the money, why I gave the money to the man. Yeah, so, so we, we, we are motivated to do something. So, so when you look at the, so there's, a, there's a difference between like motivation and this karma of intention, but that's, you know, stuff in the text and things that you're going to sort of work out. But in general, I'm talking about why we're motivated to do something. <clears throat> no? Why do we intend to do this action? The intention is the action, and then the motivation is why we did the action. 
Yeah, that's right. That's a simple way of putting it. That's nice. Yeah, that's right. I am motivated to do this action. And the motivation itself is an action, and is it also an action action? There's two types of action going on here. One is prior to the act and the other is the act. <laughs> Got it. Thank you. You're welcome. So um, let's have a look at this thing called um, causation. So there's some um, principles involved with it. So this is the first principle. An effect or effects arise from causes and cannot arise without causes. Now, um, what I like to do is play devil's advocate for this material and just try and go, okay, so let's have an effect without a cause. What, what, would, what would be the effect? <laughs> What would be the consequence? Could there be consequences? Now, we sort of ask this, and then you say, you come around, okay, effects do arise from causes. So we don't necessarily, like I said, try and you know, just believe it because it's said. In fact, the Buddha says, have a look at this, just question it. So often I like to just flip it around and go, okay, that doesn't work. So obviously this does, and then you use your own experience and go, yep, any effect, will arise from a cause or multiple multiple causes. So without those causes in place, you're not going to get the effect. So here I've put up these pine trees. You know? So the pine tree here, we can say this is an effect or a result. What would have caused them? What would have been the causes necessary for them? And then just remove them. And then say, well, could I have a pine tree there without those causes? <laughs> no, they definitely depend on causes. Yeah, okay, I agree then. That's the first principle. Second one is that causes are impermanent. This means that the cause itself is subject to change. So, for instance, um, when we work, look at a tree, we could say, well, look, you know, that one, the, the substantial cause of that tree, a cause that's really necessary, is the seed for, to produce that tree. If those are pine trees. You know, pine trees have pine cones on them. Within the little sheaves of the pine cones, there's, you know, it's, a, it's a seed. The seed goes in the ground and it's nurtured by all the conditions surrounding it, comes up and then we have a tree. Now, when that happens, the seed is gone. The seed no longer exists. The seed was subject to change and at the time of the effect, the cause is no longer there. Right? So the cause is impermanent. It's not permanent. It is subject to change. But now, um, what's also interesting about this material, I think what's, what's meant to do, is for us to take things that we can easily understand, like causes and effects of the material world, and then bring it back to ourselves. And then go, okay, so if I have like an effect of, the effect is called anger. What would have been the cause for that? That cause, we know, this is an effect. Well, effects have arisen from causes. There must be a cause of some type. But that cause, when the effect, the anger is there, is no longer there. So this is, um, this is it's quite interesting. When you do this material, and it's a nice way of like bringing it into your to your inner life. And I think that's that's the point of having so many garden examples you know, and agricultural examples because they're familiar to us. We can use them and then bring it into ourselves. And lastly, this very interesting one: effects must be concordant with their causes. So, for instance, in this story here of the. Um, pine tree, which is the effect, the cause of it must be like the seed for a pine tree. It's, it's not um, a plastic car. Uh, it's not uh, love and kindness. And, Those and causes Eddie, don't produce pine trees. It, it's also not, um, it's not, say, 
a seed for for grass seeds or rose bushes. No, that's right. Grass seeds, rose bushes produce those types of plants. Loving love and kindness does not produce pine trees. It produces something else. Right? So, so you know, if you take this idea here and you go down, relate it back to myself. If I wish to have the effect called happiness, the causes that produce it must be in concordant with it. They can't be something like a pine cone seed. They can't be a car. It can't be a lovely woman or money. That's, that's not going to work. These happy, happiness, suffering is mental. These physical things are causes that they're not going to turn into happiness. Oh man, I'm just thinking, why weren't we taught this at school? <laughs> yeah. This would have helped a great deal, isn't it? So, um, like I'm saying, please, if you find the time and, and think about this and try to um, apply it to yourself. I know this one here, effects must be concordant with their causes, made such a massive difference to my to my own life. When, when like you twig, you know, the light goes on, you go, oh my God, you know, this person, can't be the cause of my suffering. That's impossible. That's that's a wonderful boon to know. That's fantastic to know. Now you can stop blaming people for your problems. Right? It's terrific to know this. And when we experience um, uh, suffering, we have this effect, we should also know it's impermanent. It's subject to change. Ordinary happiness is subject to change. It's impermanent. It depends upon causes that are similar to its effect, but it's subject to change. Um, whoops, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so let's go to the next slide. Where Dharma Kirti says, um, where it exists, um, that arises. And when it changes, that changes as well. This is referred to as the cause. So Buddhist texts speak in terms of twofold notions of causes and conditions. So in other words, there are um, contexts in which you speak of the cause of a specific phenomena. It has to be understood as the primary agent that produced it. Like, for instance, the seed produces the sprout, and now the sprout comes the tree. Right? That's the primary cause. So you can, in the, um, in the Buddhist text, the word for cause and condition, or the understanding of the Tibetan tradition, is like it's the same word which is quite interesting when you think about it. So for instance, I'll give you an example here, which would help me to understand this. Was, you know, so we have, if you have like, um, we're talking about physical cause and effect. If you have a pine tree, obviously it's gonna come from um, the seed to produce that tree, doesn't it? So that seed is the primary cause. It's often called the substantial cause for mm -hmm. the tree. But that seed is also a condition. A condition for what, you might ask and say, well, how about the um, diminishment of hunger for a bird? Hmm. Yeah. So the bird can eat that seed, that seed decreases the hunger of the bird. Doesn't turn into the bird. It's, it's just a condition there. On the other side of it, it's a cause for a tree. Mm -hmm. So many things are like this. When you look at cause and it is like, well, it depends upon how I'm looking at this. What you know? What's the context here? The conditions. Um, when you were specific about it, 
uh, refer to factors that uh, assist in the production of the effect. Like for instance, in terms of the tree grain, we have the cause called the substantial cause, the soil, the sunlight, the water, and so forth. These are conditions which, um, cooperative conditions, which support the effect of having the tree. Seed changing and so forth. So in some, sometimes cause and condition are equivalent, and sometimes they're not. <coughs> so, which has brought us to now this, um, the topic of substantial causes. And I can see, um, how's the time here, Miffy? What's... <laughs> uh, you've got a total of 20 minutes to go. Oh, goody, because I need it. <laughs> okay. So here we've got this idea of substantial cause, and what I've put up is a simple diagram here. And like I said, so substantial cause is that which primarily produces the essential nature of its effect, as opposed to the attributes of the effect. And so here we've used this example of the of the seed and putting it into the ground, it germinates, it goes to the sprout, the seedling comes to the tree, the tree has flowers, the flowers produce the fruit. So this seed is a substantial cause of this, the tree. A little bit more about substantial cause. It's also called the material, the main, or the unique cause. These are other terms you'll find in the text. And this can, these substantial causes can be physical, mental, or abstract. So an example of a physical cause, of course, is the seed turning into uh, the flower. In terms of mental causes, you can have frustration leading into uh, anger. And abstract causes, you can have minutes that turn into hours. Or you can turn into a karma, turning into a behavior. Or karmic seed, turning into a rebirth. So basically, it's the, it's the essence of what transforms into the result. Oh, I said, yeah. So a few more examples. So that the rice seed is the substantial cause of a rice sprout, just like the seed of the plant of the pine tree is the substantial cause for the pine tree, which is its effect. And if you were to make a clay vase, the substantial cause for that clay vase is the clay itself. It's going to be transformed through the potter's wheel and the potter himself and shape given and so forth. And we have the clay pot. Now in terms of these cooperative causes, so here we've got a lot of cooperative causes, you know, so I'll put up this idea like the sun, and the sunlight, the carbon dioxide, water, minerals, the soil itself, the oxygen, lots and lots. There's millions of causes for this um, production of the strawberry plant. That's, that's got a nice little um, definition too. That which primarily produces the attributes as opposed to the essential nature of the effect. Eddie, I don't get that. What do you... Because doesn't the seed produce the attributes too? I just don't get what it means. Yeah, well, if it does, it, it contributes to it. But you're not going to have these things without the seed, are you? But the seed is the primary cause for this, the sprout or the, the plant. So then we talk about contributory causes, like, well, how tall is this plant? How yeah. many leaves does it have? Oh, okay. So then 
um, the, the, the strawberry seed produces the strawberry, but the cooperative causes depend if it's a big fat strawberry that's nice to eat or if it's one of those. Yeah, how many ones. strawberries? Okay. Some are ripe and some are not. These are all contributory conditions or contributory causes. Or cooperative causes you've got here. Yeah, yeah that's right. Cooperative causes. Now, once again, this is uh, quite interesting when you bring it around to oneself. So what are the, co the cooperative causes for a karma to produce its result in terms of our lived experience? What might that be? Well, the simple uh, answer is like reflective emotions. Without effective emotions, you're not going to have any karmas coming to fruition. Right. So is that different from, say, having a whole lot of really negative people around you? They would be conditions, but they're not cooperative causes? No, that, well, no, you could look at them as, as cooperating in, in your... Uh, but yeah, so the other uh, cooperative cause, of course, is just the fact that you're distracted and you forget about what actually causes suffering. But that's the cooperative cause. And so it gets quite, um, yeah, but yeah, you know, like I said, the thing to take away from this is that when you come to uh, the suffering that you experience, what the primary thing to take away from is it's the problem, it's not coming from it, anything external to you. This is, this is what it's telling you. We have this potential, no. and yet it's got to be nourished by a cooperative cause. What might that be? You could go. It's the fact that you forget what you already understand, that you're distracted, you go back to a habitual way of behavior. That's all cooperating. That's Eddie, could it also be response. something um, as simple as that, like you were saying, the afflictive emotion, so the cooperative cause being um, if, we're, if we've got a negative frame of mind, then that seed or ripen whereas if even if we're other people are around us who are negative if we don't have that negative frame of mind it'll just be water off a duck's back kind of oh, thing that's right yep that's right so this is ah oh, what's the, the next slide so um Again, about cooperative conditions. So this is uh, a contributory or shared or cooperative condition can be mental, physical, or abstract. So, so for example, a barley seed acts as the cause of a barley sprout, but does not act as the cause of a rice sprout. Right, so there's a this substantial cause, right? Similarly, a rice seed acts as the cause of a rice sprout, but that does not act as the cause of a barley sprout. Substantial cause again. Therefore, these seeds are posited as unique causes, whereas water and fertilizer are recognized as common causes, since they serve as the causes of both effects. Alternatively, one could say that the substantial cause is the principal producer of the essential nature of the effect. Whereas cooperative conditions are the principal producers of its attributes. For example, whether a barley sprout grows or a rice sprout grows is the function of a substantial cause. Whereas the height and quality of the sprout are principally the function of the cooperative conditions. Yeah, so this is sort of a simple way we, we can take that understanding and go, okay, now I can relate it back to my own experiences of happiness and, and unhappiness, experiences of, of taking a rebirth and so forth. So does that mean with our experiences, Eddie, that if we even if we have a, uh, a negative seed ripening, um, if we put in place good cooperative conditions, like try and be patient or tolerant or, or those yep. kind of things, then, then it's not a very big effect. ripening 
That's right. That's right. We should apply that in our understanding of our lived lives. Because even sometimes when things go terribly wrong and and a, and, and a negative seed ripens or you have a suffering experience, we can, with a lot of effort, make something good of that. So is that us having positive cooperative conditions? Yep, that's right. Yeah, sure. So again, so now an example of this, the workings of the cooperative conditions and the substantial causes. So again, finding like, the great thing to take away from this is cooperative conditions. They never ever transform into the result. So that that once again, that is so usable and tasty. Now, and this is a lovely thing when you meet up with difficult people who say the things they do to you and you experience some form of suffering, you can be certain, 100% <laughs> certain, that this person is not a substantial cause for my suffering. They can only be cooperative. Like I said, substantial causes turn into the effect. If Biffy was the cause of my suffering, she would turn into my suffering and disappear. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. And never come back. <laughs> so is that like the, the person yelling at you, if they are the cause of me, my suffering, then they would they would turn into my Your suffering. suffering. Right, right, okay. But That's they right. don't. Dang. But they never do. <laughs> no, so you know, we can see you know, when we're not when we're thinking in a particular way, we can still look at sentient beings as being, oh, these people are the cooperative conditions for my suffering. But from a, you know, if you really sort of study this, you go like, actually, you know, these people are like, are like cooperative conditions for your enlightenment, for your practice of patience. Well, that's I'll just novel. A quick slide up. So um, this idea. So there's an example here of um, causes and conditions. So here I've put up like. This, uh, I think this is from Da Vinci. So it's not just the, the body of the man, it's meant to be like the spirit and body of the man together. And down here we've got um, some molten copper. And you can see the molten copper is actually on fire. So the effects arising from the cooperative causes reside together with them, just like fire and molten copper. And up here in terms of the person, how the present body and consciousness reside together, each with its own distinct substantial causes, while acting as each other's cooperative condition. And so what this means is that, you know, sometimes when we're sick, so we say, yeah, so the body, we experience some form of sickness with the body. It affects the mind. It becomes a cooperative condition for the mind to become distressed about it. For the mind to experience what we call suffering. And so they're together and they're supporting one another. One can be a condition for the other, but they both have the same substantial causes. And they're different. So you know here, like you know, the fire doesn't cause the copper. The copper, the melting copper, doesn't cause the fire. But they're mm -hmm. residing together. So just like you know, the, the plant, the seed produces the plant, substantial cause. Then all these conditions of the leaves and how long the stalks are and how many fruit it bears, all these sorts of things. They're right along with the cause, the conditions. They're conditioned by the cause. So the effects arising from the cooperative causes reside together with them, just like fire and molten copper. Okay, great. So I'm just about on time. So yep. I'm sorry, one, Eddie. Yeah. Can you just go back a moment? I'm just trying to get my head around that. So what does 
what's the implications of that that they they reside together is that like well does that stop us running the... away with it like you know if we're sick um like you were saying if our body is experiencing suffering then our mind can also become really yeah, unhappy right. to the extent that we that. think hey what it can, it, can, it can condition the mental processes, your mind, which it does, doesn't it? It's a condition for either, um, it can be a condition for suffering, but it can also be a condition for you to yeah. remember the Dharma and go, oh, yes, all things are impermanent. Being a sentient being subject to karma and, and um, affliction, this is entirely natural. You know, and then and you um, Tom Lin practice, you can do all sorts of things. So you're experiencing a suffering result, say of a sickness, but it can be a condition for more suffering or for getting more deep into Dharma. Is that what yeah. you're saying? Yeah, yeah. Depending on the and so, yeah. So then, say, taking a positive example. Um, having a really good night's sleep, you know, we haven't have enough hours finally and we wake up refreshed. So that's a pleasant result. Um, that could be a condition for just, you know, wasting the day or it could be a condition for doing something positive. Is that what you're... Sure. Yeah. That's right. It goes right along with it, doesn't it? So... That bit where it goes right along with it, is that our room to change, our room to move there? Yeah. So this is, I think, you know, I've got to take, um, this is the big thing about karma. And it's in the slide here. Yeah, you know, we call it the war of karma. This is the way of speaking. But actually, it's, it's taken from, you know, Nagarjuna says this. And I think this is it, sums it all up. You know? From non virtues come all suffering. So the substantial cause of all suffering is non virtue. And likewise, all bad migrations, transmigration. So all the normal, unpleasant mental states, all what we call normal suffering, is coming from non virtue. But also these unfortunate rebirths, the transmigrations into the difficult realms. And this is, and it's the same on the other side. The opposite is also true. The virtues, all the happy transmigrations and pleasures of all lives. So this is really the thing to to take away and act on. Uh, if you do, you should understand that what you're actually doing is you're empowering your stuff, your, yourself. You're taking this understanding and stopping causes of future suffering for yourself and putting in place causes for future happiness for yourself. And that's that's the point of it. You know, to have a these under this, these teachings are. Have a direct effect on our on our choices, on our decisions, and the actions that we engage in in daily life. One of the wonderful things about this is that, come the time of death, if you're working in harmony with this, and you're and you're asked, do you have anything to regret? You should never say no. You can die with it real comfortable mind. In fact, you can even live with a comfortable mind. You know, and if we ask it, you know, what is the, you know, what is the practice of Dharma? You say, well, act in accordance with karma cause and effect. Um, Eddie, Sue has a question. Sure, Sue. Eddie, I'm trying to think um, in regards to great altruistic compassion. Is that the substantial cause for Buddhahood? Uh, no, you need, you need um, sort of like there's three causes you need there. So that's that's one of them. You could say it's all. But really, to achieve Buddhahood, you need 
the mind realizing emptiness, but it's got to be conjoined with that wish to achieve enlightenment. So what are the attributes then once Buddhahood has been attained? I'm getting confused with nature and attributes. Uh, it's two bodies, what he normally says, the two, the two bodies of a Buddha. There is the one, you know, the Rupakaya and the, and the Dharmakaya. Dharmakaya from the wisdom, realizing emptiness, Rupakaya from the skillful behaviors associated with the body chitta. So why is that the, oh, I'm sorry, I'm probably being picky. Why is that the attributes rather than just not the nature of it? Of the causes of, of altruistic great compassion and wisdom realizing emptiness with the conditions of all suffering sentient beings. I just, I just can't get my head around attributes in that case. Um, so attributes in relation to, to what? To Buddhahood? Yes. And you can't get your head around the idea that uh, the mind of enlightenment conjoined with the wisdom realizing emptiness produces the attributes of a Buddha. Yeah, and why is that the attributes and not the nature? Sorry, don't worry. No, it's so, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you have to look at like what 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 do you mean by nature? Well, I I probably zoned out in the question with, with the explanation because I was thinking trying to give that as an example, but it's like the um, cooperative conditions give rise to the attributes, whereas a substantial cause gives rise to the nature. Is that right? Did I get that right? This, the substantial cause gives rise to the, the result and it has to be of the same nature. Yes. Cooperative conditions give rise to the attributes. Is that right? Yep. So what are the attributes? So what are, what are the um, contributive conditions that are producing Buddhahood? Suffering sentient beings. And so what, what would be the um, effect of, of that knowledge? Being able to help suffering sentient beings. Yeah, the, the expression of, of, of great compassion towards sentient beings and the skillful means to help them, isn't it? Right. Sorry. Sorry. Right. Okay, yeah, thank I'm, you. I'm just being clear about like what... Um, you know, taking the, the example of, of um, one thing and then moving it into another. That just requires a bit more thinking time, I think, than what we've got soon. Hey, sorry, thank you. That's okay, don't be sorry, it's all right. <laughs> I mean, these are good, deep questions. It's just like, I'll probably oh, I'll just better say, I really don't know. <laughs> I can't answer that question right now like this. In this format. But I, I can I can guarantee Sue Eddie's going to be thinking about this all week and is going to come back with a really good answer. That sounds great. <laughs> yeah, so one one thing I can think of Sue is like we're talking about you know, the, the attributes of Buddhahood. Well then, you know, I mean we've got plenty of books we can look at them and say, okay, these are the attributes of a Buddha. And so forth and like work backwards and go, okay, so then in relationship to the uh, conditions what are those ah, so is that like how we have actual like there's all different types of buddhas that's the attributes of a buddha because you know that like there's 35 buddhas and there's you know the medicine buddhas so they all have different attributes well there's, yeah, you could say that there, that there are attributes that are singled out more for our attention Anyway, we've come to the end of our class, folks, and I hope, I mean, it's a lot to think about, isn't it? Please take away something as simple as this and try to apply it to your, to your life. And, you know, like I said before, get the simple understanding of the, the substantial causes 
are coming from our, our continuum. They're not out there. Right? So we want to make it real, real changes. The changes have to come from our continuum, our mental, our mind. Yeah. The primary causes of happiness and suffering are not out there. So trying to deal with them is not really a great solution for us. So what's that take away? So, you know, there's a general law of causality and karma is an instance of that. It's primarily to do with our feelings. But from the feelings we respond, we create new karma, new actions. And so hopefully we'll know, you know, what differentiates a substantial cause from, from a condition. So somebody tell me what does before I leave you. What's the difference here? <laughs> that a substantial cause turns into the thing. That's right. Conditions don't. Exactly right. Thank you. That's what you've got to take away. <laughs> so next we're going to talk about these four general characteristics of karma and use this analogy of the sea to, to contribute to these, you know, explain these four general characteristics. And um, we come to the end. So We've created merit, so and it's virtuous merit. We've brought a good intention to study this. We've been doing the best we can. So let's take that and dedicate it so that we can quickly attain the state of a Guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. And may the supreme dual body tutor not yet born arise and grow. May that born have no decline but increase forevermore. But as long as space abides, as long as sentient beings abide, we too will abide to dispel their suffering. So we, we act in accordance with our aspirations. I thank you, everybody, and um, I hope it was useful and that you'll come back next week and we'll, we'll keep <laughs> on going to this class. Um, see you, and, and thank you, Shayla, and thank you, Amitabha Dundra, and, and of course, everyone who's, who's turned up. Thank you, Bob, for your questions. <laughs> That's great. And we'll see you all again later on. Bye-bye eh? then. <laughs>